What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Web3 with a Splash of Wine podcast, where we talk about blockchain technology, DeFi, NFTs, and all kinds of other Web3 vibes. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and nothing said on the podcast should be taken as financial or legal advice. Let's dive into it. GM, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Web3 with a Splash of Lime podcast. I'm your host, Jivko, part of Lime Chain and co-founder of EnterDAO. And today I have a very special guest, uh, Luke from PrimeDAO and Collectivo Labs. And for me, this is a very special episode because Luke is, I think, at least for me, one of the most knowledgeable people on the topic of DAOs. Uh, and it's a real honor to, to have him on the podcast. Welcome to the show, Luke. Thank you so much, Sifko. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, right back oh, at you. Like, likewise. I mean, Luke has been basically building around DAO since 2018. He was uh, initially part of a DAO stack organized events called the DAO Fest. Uh, me and him were doing events in the middle of the bear market in Amsterdam and where not. Um, and he's been building around DAOs for all these years. And today I want to basically um, offer you guys a foundational episode on DAOs, um, including everything from um, starting from the very basic of definition of DAO, uh, coordination issues, tooling, uh, startup parks, etc. But before we go into all of this, um, look, can you just give an intro of uh, what you're doing and how did you get into crypto and DAOs? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm Luke. I was born and raised in the Caribbean in a small island called Curaçao. Um, growing up there, I was always, um, I'd say, curious about entrepreneurship and organizations, uh, but also lazy. So I never really did anything back on the island. Um, Later, I moved to the Netherlands and I started studying business administration and also philosophy. And this is really the point where I first at least touched crypto. Um, my cousin is a crypto trader, like from like early days, 2012, 13. And he shared with me Bitcoin, at least the white paper. And basically from that moment, I've been extremely deep down the rabbit hole. I left everything that I was doing um, because here there was this thing that touched both of the two things that I was super passionate about. On the one side, business and organization and getting people to do things. The other side, kind of the philosophical part of crypto blockchain DAOs, the way of being able to rethink how we're going to shape our future, what values are going to dictate what we do, how do we coordinate with people. It really yeah, it resonated so well with me. Um, so I went deep into crypto blockchain, initially started the Caribbean Blockchain Network, um, a group of mainly youngsters working on blockchain use case in the Caribbean. This was 2016, 17. Um, and back then I also used to run blockchain events in the Netherlands called Blockchain Talks. Um, so this was really the introduction. And then around, I'd say mid 18, uh, we got in touch with DAOstack. They explained to us what a DAO was. Uh, we didn't experience the whole the DAO um, happening that much. I was very at the early stage of, crypto, of my crypto journey back then still. I had no idea what that whole thing was. Uh, but then when DAO stack started talking about DAOs, for us, it really was a um, a realization moment that these technologies, these blockchain technologies that for us really represented transparency, resiliency, digital nativeness, trend, kind of these key terms that, especially coming from a small Caribbean island, you respect a lot, um, that you could now bake this into organizations and that lowers the coordination cost just so much that, yeah, we were sold from the first moment. Um, and ever since I've rebranded or like renamed myself Luke Dow, I've been touching and doing everything Dow related from, like you said, in the early eight day with Dow Fest, and now more recently uh, with projects like the Dowist and Prime Dow, but also with Collectivo trying to bring Dows to the real world. Awesome. I appreciate, um, appreciate sharing your background. And I really love what you're doing because you're, for me at least, I think you're one of the most selfless people in the community and you've always tried to build networks you've always tried to build and work on projects that have social impact for example like the stuff that you're doing in the caribbean for me i think it's amazing and i love what you guys are doing there um and just to jump start this episode i'm going to ask a very simple and yet difficult question uh, at least for me sometimes it's difficult to answer it um especially for like 
normie people. Um, what? How would you define a DAO to the best of your abilities? Yeah, to the best of my abilities. I think starting with recognizing that there is no one definition of a DAO. No one, or at least the industry, hasn't agreed on one specific black or white, this is a DAO and this is not. Um, and I think what's really interesting there is, the, is that Every part of DAO, so it means decentralized autonomous organization, on itself is like a spectrum. Something can be decentralized to a certain extent, um, but then to others, that's not a DAO. Or something may be extremely centralized, but it still uses the same technology, it could still be a DAO. So, I mean, starting first, the meaning is decentralized autonomous organization, but there's, it's a very big spectrum of what a DAO is. But the very basic of it, is that it's an organization, a digital first organization where people can align around shared goals. And I think that that is an ultimately kind of the, the starting ground of every DAO is needing something of a vision or a direction or values that people would want to align with. Um, yeah, for me, that is a DAO. I really see it much more as a network of people and things um, than that I see it as um, a social club or a there are different kind of different definitions for it awesome and i love that you didn't tr didn't try to give like a black and white answer i definitely agree that it's a spectrum um on my end i sometimes define it like a very simply like a digital cooperative with a shared mission but for a lot of people this can so this can sound very abstract or they can they can't imagine how it works in practice. And I think one of the reasons behind all of this is because there's no, um, just because the call space is so new and emerging and we're constantly experimenting and uh, innovating, um, there's no set framework or guidelines or how to um, create it all and what um, coordination tools to use. So we're obviously going to dive a lot deeper into coordination, but um, Let's say that you would want to, let's say you have a brilliant idea this weekend and you want to start a new DAO um, next week. Um, how would you approach all of this and what tools are you going to use for, for the purpose? Yeah, I think that's a good question. So again, starting with what is a DAO? It's a movement of people trying to achieve something together. I think a lot of um, validation can be done by yourself. Um, ask yourself, am I really passionate about the thing that I'm proposing? Do I feel that other people are passionate or willing to align with this? Um, and really sharpen the idea of what you want to achieve. Oftentimes, especially recently, you would see DAOs that set out with this great big mission saying, we're going to change the world and make all unbanked people banked and yada, yada, um, which is wonderful. But you should also kind of take a step back first and realize, okay, what can we feasibly achieve? Or, um, and I think that really is the core kind of tinkering out for yourself, what type of organization am I trying to create? And as soon as you have that, I think iterations, kind of feedback loops, first you invite five people, you make a Twitter account and you tweet about it, getting your first five, 10 people in there, iterate with those people. What are their values? What do they want to achieve? What do they, what can they bring to the table? And I've seen these kind of iterative um, this kind of iterative approach of onboarding more people, making sense with it, them together, and then onboarding another group of people, again, making sense of the reality um, to be one of the best, if not the best way to create a DAO. Um, because what you will often see is if you start or you want to start too big, either the DAO is going to divert a lot from what your initial mission vision approach was, um, or you may get a very big influx of people that are more, I would say, short-minded. They come in, it's a great hype now, we're gonna change the world, unbank all the, un bank all the unbanked people, but then realizing after two months that it doesn't go that fast. It's not a one or two week or two month project. This is just like any other organization, it takes years and years to achieve something. Um, so if you're really going for this kind of long-term, if you, if you want to create a DAO with, which hopefully becomes mature, I would really go for starting small, getting five, 10, 15 people in there, iterate with them, learn with them, then invite, try to scale to hundred people or whatever amount you think is feasible. Um, but, but maybe turning it around, I wouldn't let that hold you back either. I think trying something 
And learn by doing is also one of the best ways to learn how to create a DAO. Just go out, invite three friends, start something. Um, I think a great example was the Constitution DAO, which was a DAO that wanted to buy one of the, late, the last versions of the American Constitution. This started as a very small Twitter account, but within, I think it was two weeks, hundreds, if not thousands of people rallied behind it. You can really see how fast it can scale sometimes. No, absolutely. Um, I think the, the Constitution DAO is a great example. And um, I think we're just, this is going to trigger, and it's already <laughs> has triggered like a wave of DAOs that gather around with the purpose of just buying this one asset, whether it's a digital one or physical one, that is otherwise unattainable for one single uh, buyer and creating a community around that, of course. Um, so just to go a bit more granular, let's say that I'm inviting um, a few friends starting a new DAO. Um, how would it work, look in the beginning? Would it be, in your opinion, just a group chat with a multi or shared wallet and a Twitter page? And how would you build on top of that in terms of the tooling stack? Yeah, so... It would definitely look like a group chat with just a Twitter page and potentially a valueless token, just something that we deploy ourselves, maybe even on a test net, and we just start keeping track of things. Um, maybe one good insight there is something that I'm a big fan of is tokenizing early, but not tokenizing with the intent to make profit or money of it in any way, but really having it as a way to experiment with how would you want your token to function. Would you want it to be an access token? Would you want it to be a reward token? Do you want it to be a governance token? Um, a lot of these things sound great in your mind, but when you test them out, you realize that they're either unfunctional or not. Um, so that's also something we did early on with, with the DAO Fest. We had a Fest token. It wasn't worth anything. It didn't do much, but it taught us a lot about how we would want a token to work and where we would want to um, maybe have actual on-chain voting or have um, so on the blockchain voting. Um, so exp again, experimenting early and just trying things out early on uh, will teach you a lot. And then when it comes to tooling, I would even say in most early cases, you don't even need something like a multi-sig or any on-chain voting. What you just need is people that are willing to, that have something something of a shared mission or shared values um, that they're willing to coordinate against or behind. Awesome. And one last question on the tooling, uh, and then we can dive deeper into um, coordination and scaling up DAOs, uh, and also DAO to DAO collaboration, which I know you're super passionate about. Um, I often get questions like about people that are either in the industry, but usually non-technical people mm -hmm. that want to start a DAO, uh, but they can't really deploy a token. Like, is there a go-to platform in your opinion, for people to like set up a, a DAO and it's talking, is it uh, DAO stack? Is it Aragon? Is it DAO house? What would you basically recommend for, for starters? Yeah, so it really depends on what your needs are. In most cases, a DAO house DAO would be the simplest. It's really easy to spin up. Um, it's not super complex, which is and sometimes a good thing that you don't have too many buttons to push and decisions to be made. Um, Aragon also has a pretty nice um, DAO suite that you can use, um, especially these frameworks were really great for experimentation, just setting it up fast. And then later on, you can realize kind of what specific trade-offs you want to make. Another really simple one is Snapshot. You do need um, some sort of a token for, but launching an ERC-20 or something is not that hard. I think even if you're non-technical, if you spent a weekend on it with, with two friends, you should be able to figure it out. Um, sure. And I think that could potentially be the first kind of task of the DAO, figuring out how we deploy the DAO token and really through such initiatives, are you going to um, yeah, really get a hold of it? Sounds good. No, I appreciate that. And this is really a question that pops up quite, quite often. I'm glad that, that we answered it. But okay, so we went through setting up a DAO, like the early stages of the DAO and I would like to basically gradually move the conversation uh, in the direction of the life cycle of a DAO. Mm -hmm. So obviously what comes next is 
um, scaling up the DAO and the challenges that comes with it. Because um, when you're five people with a group chat, uh, and maybe the token, maybe not, like decisions are made easier, coordination happens quite easy. But when the DAO starts building products, if they have products where there are more people, coordination um, starts to basically become more complex. There, like, there may be politics, there may be other things. So, for, first question I have here is what do you think are the biggest challenges for scaling DAOs? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is contributor health. And this may be a very weird one, um, but I see that a lot of DAOs are optimizing for the kind of crypto really fast paced culture, um, which is really hard to stay connected to. If you're a employee of a company, the company has some sort of responsibility to keep you informed, to keep you taken care of, to make sure that you feel good working there. DAOs oftentimes move at the pace of the industry which means that things could go extremely fast, that things may happen in the weekend, that you wake up on Monday, you worked until late afternoon Friday, and still you're out of the loop on Monday. Um, and I think that this is one of the biggest challenges for the DAO space right now, because we are essentially creating organizations and structures of hundreds of people, or at least tens of people, in a matter of a couple months which is incredible if you think about a traditional company life cycle. You start as a startup with like six people that takes a year and a half. Then you slowly scale up. It takes another three years. Then you're up to 50 people maybe. Um, in DAOs, it's comp that this all happens in the span of like three to six months, um, which make it really hard for existing contributors to stay along and to continue to feel connected. And these values and missions that we set out to achieve early on to continue to kind of resonate um, with the DAO, and I think that that really is one of the biggest friction points right now. A lot of people want to contribute to DAOs, and then DAOs want to move really fast. And it's almost not giving people the time to really um, sit and contribute in a meaningful way because they're constantly chasing, keeping up to date with the latest developments. Um, that's one thing. Um, I think the other one is kind of relates to that is formal onboarding and really welcoming people into a group. Um, again, this goes extremely way too fast in any DAO. It's like, hey, jump on this call and next week you can start. What do I do? I have no idea. Do the DAO thing. How will I get paid? Yeah, talk to this guy. They'll tell you how to get paid. Or read this document. And it's kind of everything that a normal company would, one, iterate on for many, many, many years to have good documentation, to have a formal process, to have um, physical people. I think this is also another challenge. It's completely digital. It's great. But when you go work at a normal company, you'll get someone that holds your hand, almost literally for the first week. They'll show you all the faces inside of the organization, all the different characters, all the different languages that are being used. And this is completely, or almost completely gone in most DAOs. It's very impersonal. So here you have a group of people that barely know each other that are working at the speed of light on extremely innovative technology with a whole bunch of pressure because everything is transparent and token driven. Um, and I think that is one of the biggest challenges for um, scaling DAOs right now. It's just this friction between DAOs seeming, seeming to not have any time to build anything. I think a good example is Prime DAO took for one product. It took, I think it was eight or nine months to develop it from like idea to now going live. And we are considered extremely slow. People are like, oh, why are you guys so slow? Like, well, we build a product from idea to market validation, to research, to UX, to branding, to everything that a normal company would take a solid year and a half, maybe two years from to really ship something into market. That is expected that you, you do it in three months. And that creates so much friction because you want, during that three months, you also want to onboard new people. And then what you end up with is that people are so busy that the only thing that they can care about is the two colleagues that they work with every day. And then you get kind of, yeah, secluded groups inside of DAOs again, and it becomes almost like traditional companies um, all over again. I think this was an, an amazing insight, and I'm glad that you brought, brought up both points. First one with health, I think it's like, doesn't get talked about because it's a 24-7 industry. It doesn't sleep, and everything is open source, so the speed of the industry is nuts, and people burn out all the time. 
And as a as a person who takes pride in taking care of my health and everything, I'm glad that you brought this point, and I hope that, that I actually implore more people to start thinking about their health uh, when they're building and trying to basically catch up with the speed of the industry. But the second point I think was also really interesting because DAOs on one side are looked as a new and like novel form of um, company organization or like an organizational structure. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have all these um, value adds and benefits that and pros that comes uh, from Web3, like decentralization and everything. But it also comes with like some um, cons and disadvantages like it's hard to onboard people. It's hard to pay them. Like some people need to pay bills, uh, like rent and stuff like that. Um, so it's hard to have like a proper legal structure around it. And this creates friction for DAOs, not only on um, the level of onboarding new contributors, but also uh, on a if B2B level, if you want, or like dealing with other DAOs and organization, let's call it DAO to DAO. I think mm -hmm. this is a term that... Uh, you guys are using. So um, I want to basically segue the conversation in DAO to DAO collaboration um, in this domain. And I know that you guys are prime or working on a bunch of things there. So um, let's, let's start off with what is prime DAO and what collaboration challenges are you guys solving, solving over there? Yeah, I'm super excited about this one. Um, maybe before I dive into that, one of the things that DAOs are really good at um, is coordinating between different stakeholder groups because it's very, very in your face where the decision making happens, um, which is maybe hard when you're running a small team and you're having to decide which color you want your brand to be. It's going to just bring in a lot of different voices that you may not want to even have there and because everyone can now share their voice and they will. But when you're having multi-stakeholder systems, let's say, um, an organization that exists of the government, five sponsors, and three development teams. Traditionally, there was no central place for that all to come together and find alignment. And I think that's one of the best things that DAOs can do is really bringing multiple stakeholder groups together and providing an infrastructure for them to collaborate. Um, and that's really kind of what we try to frame Prime DAO as. Uh, we see our mission as enabling more collaborative systems. So trying to flip the picture around instead of 10 startups trying to compete for one success, what of these 10 startups would work together and generally almost diversify their risk away by collaborating. Because if you're competing, it's almost like it's like, it's like, almost like a zero sum game. You win, I lose. But when we collaborate, you can win and I can win. We can both succeed. Maybe we don't become a trillionaire or a multi-billionaire, but we will all have good lives. We will all succeed at achieving what we want to achieve. So it really is kind of the, the tinkering behind Prime DAO. We believe DAOs can help change these eco the economic kind of games from purely competitive where you um, patent everything and you keep everything for yourself because you work so hard for it to open systems like blockchains are supposed to be where we share knowledge, build on top of each other. And one industry where you really see that a lot is in DeFi, where you see financial applications, but also, I guess, in NFTs, where you see um, digital assets kind of being built on top of each other and really supporting each other and creating this ecosystem. So PrimeDAO is, on the one hand, a builder hub of organizations that want to build DAO innovations. And together, they created a whole suite of products that help DAOs through their full life cycle, starting with a launch, launching a DAO, um, initiating a token, creating liquidity for a token through prime pools, but then also furthermore going into deals, agreements between different DAOs, um, where again, they, they don't just take the inside stakeholders and say, hey, you guys should work together, but you also look outside and you say, hey, we're trying to build, I don't know, we're making an AMM that can be, con that may, can be connected to um, emerging markets. But maybe there are three other teams that are doing almost the same. Why should we compete and slim the chance for, for any of us succeeding? Why wouldn't we collaborate and make deals? Hey, if you guys build on this, we'll build on this. We'll swap some of our tokens so we both have a stake or an incentive inside of each other's network. We can either govern things together because we now hold tokens of each other. And this really, or hopefully, really changes the paradigm 
for DAOs where DAOs can generally push this whole industry forward, the DAO industry, and really compete with centralized traditional alternatives, not by the notion that we have blockchain coins or anything in that direction, but by the sheer notion that our economic system is optimized for collaboration. And I'm a big, I, I'm a big believer in collaboration. I think it always will in the end outcompete competition. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we're trying to do in Prime. That we're building these products, we're building different, we're bringing different groups together. Um, and especially now that we're uh, about to relaunch our products, uh, we're looking more and more at collaborations between Prime DAO and other DAOs that are already existing that have similar needs um, and are new, now collaborating with us to build it, all these things out. No, that's amazing. And there's so much to, to unpack there. Uh, I want to start from the very beginning. You mentioned that um, one of the things that you guys are building in Prime and enabling is basically helping people launch their token and bootstrap the liquidity for it. Could you elaborate more on that? Like, how do you guys do it and why is liquidity important for, for a token for people that are not yeah. uh, that deep in AMMs and everything? You know what the fun thing is? I think a lot of people that are deep in DeFi and AMM still don't truly understand why this is so important. 100%. Um, so let's see a token as a um, representation of some values. It could be access, it could be a function like money, like I pay Zifco for doing things in Prime with Prime, but it doesn't have to be. It could also just be access or it could just be a um, in the form of an NFT, something that I just showcase that I'm aligned with something. The different ways to value tokens, um, but one of the main ways that it happens in markets is through um, exchanging something for something else. And through that, you can understand what value it has relative to something else. So traditionally in cryptocurrencies, there would be these web tools, so traditional companies, businesses that would facilitate the trade between one token and another. You could almost see it like two nations having trade agreements. You can trade, you can trade a euro for the dollar at any time because people are willing to exchange it. They're willing to hold dollars and they're willing to hold euros. They see both as being valuable and therefore you have a market. If something doesn't have a market, that means you cannot buy or sell it. It generally is much less of it of an asset because it's not something that you can utilize to transfer it to something else. So for example, in the early days of DAOs, we didn't have these decentralized exchanges that allow anyone to create a market between two or multiple assets. The only way to get your token to be transferable to some, to any other value in the world would be to talk to decentralized exchanges to hopefully get your token listed. Back in the days, it was the only question. When, when this, when that, are you going to get listed? Because without being, without being listed, you could not have that market, which generally mean no one could buy or sell into your economy. And that's really bad. It stops trade. And without trade, you don't have any circulation. Um, so when DeFi came around last, let's say two years, they came with a concept um, called automated money markets, AMMs. And that generally allows anyone anywhere in the world to create a market for any asset, basically. It really is revolutionary to think about that, that now I can decide um, from my bedroom or living room that I see value in, let's say, um, coral reefs, and I can make a token worth a coral reef. And I say, hey, I also hold Bitcoin, and I'm willing to allow anyone that has Bitcoin to trade it for my coral reefs and anyone that holds coral reefs to trade it for my Bitcoin. And I'm going to charge a small fee on that. And this concept of market making um, has really been democratized through DeFi. And it allows now anyone, as long as more people agree that these two things have value and are willing to trade them, um, to create a market for assets. So in the case of DAOs, it's, it's now possible to trade for example, Prime DAO's token for a Balancer DAO token, or and this allows community. To, so not it's not just the financial part; it's also really the human and um, cultural part. It allows you to participate in multiple communities, to become part of it, to also step out of it if you don't want to be part of it. And that's also a concept that really keeps coming back in these AMMs. It's liquidity. How much movement can you facilitate? How much trade is being facilitated? And that's some sort of a measure as well of kind of health of a system. 
if there are a lot of people coming in and people coming out and that is um, happening a lot, you have high liquidity and with high liquidity, um, at least if your markets are also growing with it, um, would mean that it becomes easier and cheaper and faster to go from one community to another. Um, so that's why it's super important to have these AMMs and to have this kind of combination between DeFi and DAOs. And I think also that's potentially why we're now seeing this, all these DAOs emerge because technology wise, honestly, we're not that far away from two years ago. Two years ago, we had almost the same technology as now when it comes to DAO tooling and governance and multi six. The biggest change was that back then we did not have these AMMs and the DeFi markets to facilitate these relationships between DAOs. Um, and I think we're really just at the start of this. No, sure. And I love how you basically painted the whole picture and put DeFi at the core of it as an enabler of all of this. Um, so I have my DAO set up. Uh, we have the token, we have some liquidity on it. Um, we have a community, we're building products. Um, so we're now later into the life cycle of a DAO where we have products, we have community, and we can even collaborate with other DAOs um, that are building similar or complementary products. You you mentioned that you're big on collaboration rather than competition. I think um, this is a core value of the Web3 community. Um, could you give an example of how two DAOs would collaborate and how mm -hmm. Prime enables them uh, via token exchange or like any other method to basically align incentives and their, their values? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we're currently working on Prime deals, which will be the product that facilitates these DAO to DAO transactions. Um, the first use case that we're focusing on are token swaps and joint ventures. Um, token swaps is pretty straightforward. It's changing my token for your token. Um, this does a couple things. One, it creates mutual skin in the game. Basically, it means that I hold a piece of you, you hold a piece of me. So if I'm in need of help, you'll most likely come to my rescue because it also helps yourself. So even if you don't like me, you're still geared towards collaboration. Um, it also facilitates some co-ownership and co-responsibility. If I have a governance post up, if you don't have my tokens, you're most likely not going to read it and care about it. But now you do, so you're going to be, hey, maybe this is important for my community as well. So it creates attention across two organizations. And maybe taking the asset approach, it also allows you to diversify some of your risk away. If you are a DAO and you're building something with just the 20 people that are in your DAO and the only token that you have in your treasury is, let's call it just the Zivko DAO token or whatever, at some point, no, if the market for Zivko DAO drops, so will all the other things around your DAO because you're not holding any other assets, your whole value is going down. So by partnering with other DAOs, you're creating a more resilient DAO for yourself. You're, you're kind of hedging away some of the risk of being alone and sharing it with other, with other groups that you feel aligned with. The other one is the, I would say, more proactive approach. Um, this could be either a shared grant or a joint venture. Let's say your DAO and my DAO, we both have a problem. We both want to enable a new voting strategy, but no one has built it, built it yet. Instead of us having to invest all our resources and energy, and maybe we don't even have all the technical skills in-house, we can open up this joint venture proposal in Prime Deals where we say, hey, we're trying to build governance technology that does A, B, and C. We're looking for three other DAOs that want to help co-fund this. Um, and we're primary, and we're still looking for a designer and two front-end devs, for example. By publicly, um, by initiating this kind of public offering, like, hey, we as DAO A are willing to take the first step. And that really sparks so much. Um, this is a trick I used to, <laughs> this fun, fun trick for everyone at home watching. If you're trying to start an event, Work really close with just one sponsor. As soon as you have the first sponsor, all the other ones will come. No one wants to take the first step. It's always so hard to convince the first one. But once you have alignment of one or two DAOs, it's quite easy to find the third, the fourth, and the fifth to complete a product. Um, so that really is the reason behind this joint venture, that there is a lot of there are a lot of DAOs that have specific needs that may not be their core offering that they want to solve. 
but they don't have enough internal needs or resources to pull it off themselves. Um, so by enabling these DAOs to make clear what they're trying to build and communicate to others what they may need or what they're wanting to start, um, we hope that it would see more of these kind of collaborative efforts where multiple groups would work together. I think one of the best examples now would potentially be Gitcoin. Um, so for the people who don't know Gitcoin, Gitcoin um, is an ecosystem of different things, but one thing that is very popular or like famous for is for Gitcoin grants, where every, I think it's every three months, um, a whole bunch of blockchain organizations donate funds to a matching pool, um, which is distributed between all the different grants um, pro rata on small grants that they received, so on donations that are received. So for example, if I run a campaign for my project in Curacao, and I would get 50 people to give me $1, Gitcoin would match it maybe with $300 from this, from this matching pool. But if Gitcoin did not exist, most likely all these DAOs would not be donating tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to public goods, so goods that benefit everyone. But because Gitcoin is very vocal about it and saying, we're going to do it, everyone is following, everyone just fits in line because everyone kind of wants it, but no one is sufficiently willing to do it themselves. Um, and I really think that there, these kind of DAO to DAO engagements will not only make DAOs better because the technology and resources will be better, um, but it will also make them more resilient because we're going to operate more as one big ecosystem. Um, instead of saying, hey, DAO A is using bad governance, we're going to beat them. We're going to beat them in what? Like we're still all in the same battle against traditional ownership structures, traditional coordination structures. Um, traditional economies that are extracting so much value from nature. I think there's so many challenges that by the sheer fact that someone is starting a DAO, they're most likely 95% in line with what you're trying to do. Um, that is just so much better to collaborate. No, for sure. And I, I love basically how you close that point that if I can use a metaphor, like we're currently at the stage where we're trying to create a bigger pie rather than divide it. Mm -hmm. So we should focus on um, collaborating and working together to uh, create a more vibrant and abundant ecosystem for everyone. And the DAO to DAO collaboration can happen in this, let's say, mid stage of the DAO life cycle. But obviously, if we call it a life cycle, which has a beginning and, a, and an end. And unfortunately, a lot of DAOs will just die off for various reasons where Either their products are unsuccessful, founders lose interest, uh, tokens lose its value, whatever, um, internal wars, whatever. Um, but that's not necessarily how every DAO sh should end. And we're starting to see um, signs of the first, let call it MA activity if you want. Like a few months ago, I think um, Inverse Finance acquired a project called Tonic Finance with the first on-chain acquisition. And uh, more recently, I think uh, Rari and um, the Fay Protocol announced that uh, they're going to merge. Um, do you see more of these merges and acquisitions happening? And how do you think would a success story for a DAO end? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting topic and one that, that I'm super kind of into. So mergers and acquisitions is part of the prime deals kind of feature product suite. Um, one thing that I think there is the earlier you can merge, the better. Um, projects that just start off, it's much better for, for them to early on already see who is aligned and either join them or work with them from the get go. Because these DAOs, um, let me try to phrase as well. So these DAOs have like internal coordination systems. They kind of, certain behavior is rewarded, other behavior is punished. Um, there's this whole kind of cultural building inside of a DAO. But right now, because everything is digital, you have no idea how these systems work and what kind of real culture and values a community has. Because, and this again comes back to the point I mentioned earlier, we're so, all so busy we generally don't even have time to think about what we really want to achieve. We don't have time about who we really are. Um, I think a good example is you guys with LimeChain. You took so many years to improve and iterate on what it means to be part of LimeChain. What 
the organization looks like, what kind of rituals you have. But those things are really hard to see from an outside perspective. And in DAOs, it's even worse because most things are figured out through a forum. It's one of the least personal ways of communicating with someone and finding like an alignment on something. So here you are dealing with five people that you don't even know if that's actually their name. They have an image of a frog and an image of a boat. You're trying to align with them, not just on financial value, but also on what are we going to build? Why are we building it? Who are we building it with? Who are we building it for? Kind of all these hard questions that are just are already really hard to figure out in normal companies. In normal companies, if you do a merge and acquisition, it takes months, if not years, to come to an agreement. You would have meetings. You would go on boat trips together. It's beep. Like, it's not great. Why would you go on a boat trip with your potential? But it's super important. Like, these traditional rituals, like playing golf. I, I never did it with anyone. But I can imagine that after playing golf for, like, two hours, that you have a much better understanding of who is this person? What are they trying to achieve? Um, but we don't have that in DAOs right now. So I think a good example is, like, especially this Faye Rari proposal that turned out to go really, I don't think it's succeeding. I think it's actually failing right now because of this. Okay. Two groups both want something different. And what you're most likely going to see happen is that either it becomes a big fight because um, stakeholders come in with different incentives. Some people are in it completely for the money. Others are in it completely for the, for the potential, for the tech, for the vision. Um, so I do think that, again, it's a really exciting potential, but I think that the earlier you merge, and the more engagements you have together, the better. And the way I would envision this kind of merger cycle to work and what I think DAOs are really good at is starting with a token swap, starting with a partnership, saying, hey, we don't need to merge right now. We can partner, we can share ABC and maybe do a retreat together or host an event together and do that now for three months. And then in three months later, um, go deeper if you have to. Um, but again, there's so many things that you need to take in consideration there. Maybe your team doesn't have the funding to do that, or there's not enough people around to keep it alive. Um, but I think that's maybe a final really interesting point is that DAO should be fine to die off. Um, let's remember, it's not just a financial game. People may see DAOs as like the next frontier for making money, but it's essentially not. It's a collective. It's a group of people trying to achieve something. And maybe sometimes they realize that we're not going to achieve this in this way. And it should be fine to dissolve a DAO. I think it's actually really healthy and good to let organizations die off. Um, and, and maybe that goes back to the very, very beginning of the health thing that we mentioned, kind of contributor health is so important. DAOs don't have feelings. They don't care at all. They have no feelings. People have feelings. If we're going to force people to stick around, I think a good example is Sushi right now. So Sushi is and maybe was and maybe is one of the most successful DAOs, but there's a lot of pressure on the core team, a lot of jumps that they're making out of pure survival mindset. Like they don't get the praise or the recognition that they feel that they deserve and no one is capable or willing to take their role. So now they're in a bad spot. They're not happy. The community is not happy. A lot of friction and everything is being kind of resolved over open public Twitter messages. I think it's it's really exciting, but also scary to see um, how fast DAOs move. Uh, everything if DAOs goes fast, from culture to rewards to, um, yeah, I think that's really my kind of observation. No, I, I love it. And um, I love how it basically went through the whole life cycle and, uh, of a DAO. And we came back to the very beginning of like, basically the contributors held because if you haven't built anything or you haven't been actively building or contributing to a DAO, like it's hard to imagine sometimes the pressure that comes with it, especially if this thing has like a token that is like a recognizable one and there's a community always um, pressuring you to do certain stuff, people investing their life money into the token and saying the threats and whatnot. So um, I'm really grateful for everyone that is building and I really hope that people can uh, pay more attention to both their mental and physical health. Um, last question on my end in terms of collab collaboration, and we can, I have like one or two more questions for you and we can wrap it up. Um, 
I'll try to play devil's advocate here or just throw you a curveball. Um, we talked about how DAOs should collaborate um, and it's better for everyone to collaborate rather than compete. But maybe it's something that I've noticed and you haven't ever come across this. Just want to ask you, do you think there can be such thing as toxic collaboration, especially in the very early stages of a project where basically Web3 is a community where it's mostly young people having fun building cool things, but and a lot of people are, hey, we should collaborate. And sometimes these products have like, the products that people are building uh, do not even touch or complement each other. And I, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I sense that there's a lot of collaboration and partnership just for the sake of like announcements and uh, announcing the collabor collaboration. And do you think that's the case and have you come across this? I definitely think this is something that's happening. Um, I think it, again, comes with this pressure from the general industry that you want to show something, you want to deliver. If you feel that if you don't move for a week that people are going to call you slow or message you say, why didn't you do A or B? And I think it's a very negative culture uh, because not only do you kind of take value away from the real partnerships, um, it also creates even more... I would say misaligned communities because now you have a community that tends to optimize for just sheer announcements and not for the actual value that's being created partner with another community that is mostly geared that way. And then no one is going to even care about that partnership and hopefully it pumps your bags for two days, but in the long run, there's no real relationship between these communities. Um, so yeah, I definitely think it's something bad. And I think it's something that sadly we're seeing more and more of recently. Um, and I think it's just a kind of a symptom of a bull market where there's so much things happening that you need to announce something new every day to stay relevant. And it's driving people, I wouldn't say nuts, but I see more and more people around me asking for a bear market, not because they want their own tokens to go down because they want to lose half of their money, but mainly because they just need some peace of mind. They need people to slow down and uh, have five meetings and just talk to them before coming to a partnership and not saying, oh yeah, do a post on the forum, write two paragraphs and we'll do a swap of $5 million, uh, which is something that has been happening more and more lately. I appreciate the honesty and I get what you're saying with like, the, nobody wants bear markets, but there's a lot of noise in like bull markets and super cycles and it's hard for builders out there. Um, one last question on my end, because so, I'm also conscious of your time and don't want to keep you on this for too long and also don't want to make the episode too long. Mm -hmm. But I think this last question is equally important as everything that we've touched upon, maybe if not more important. We've talked about DAOs as a basically coordination tool but we've talked about them mostly in the context of building Web3 products and 99% of the DAOs are um, around DeFi, NFTs, or like these super niche high-tech communities that sometimes can, if you step away, if you zoom out, they can seem like super abstract and disclosed like cyberpunk ecosystem. Um, I wanted to touch base on what you guys are doing at Collectivo real quick because um, what you guys are doing is using this technology and using Web3 to create um, actual social impact uh, and improve people's lives. So just wanted to basically um, ask you to give me the, the runaround on Collectivo and uh, share some of the activities that you guys are doing, uh, especially in Curacao. Yeah, of course. Um, so one thing, again, DAOs are great at build, bringing multiple stakeholders together under some sort of a shared mission. Um, with Collectivo, we're trying to create what we call regenerative economies, which are economies that create social impact. And by creating social impact, create new value and new resources to create more social impact. So the idea of regeneration is that every time that you, may, that you do something, you improve the conditions for it to happen again. So every time that we plant a forest, we're creating the condition for more forest to be created. Every time that we create a coral reef, we're improving the conditions for the second coral reef or the next coral reef. 
to be created. Um, it's a very, I guess, healthy evolution of the term sustainable, or sustainable development, where sustainable is very much about keeping a certain level that we have now, and regeneration um, is improving the level where we are now. Um, so what we're trying to do is create a tool set, especially for local communities. Um, maybe this is a really a fun part for me to touch base on real quick. It's the tension between local and global. Um, if you're digital, you're almost always per definition global. Um, something we are not seeing a lot right now yet is like regional DAOs and like specific language, let's say Dutch or Spanish, or I think we're going to see that more and more. But right now, most DAOs are global. Um, but there's a weird tension between local and global because for me, the tree outside of my house, it has value for me, it has value for my neighbor, but you couldn't care less about it. It's not yours, you don't benefit from it. Um, so with Collectivo, we're trying to create um, local regenerative economies that allow communities to create DAOs around the things that are valuable for them. Um, again, food forests, coral reefs, uh, mangrove forests, um, social impact projects, um, education projects, they're extremely valuable for that local um, community. And the cool thing about our pilot in Curacao, um, so we're building Collectivo together with Cello um, and the Climate Collective, um, but the first pilot is in Curacao, in the island where I'm from. And the cool thing is that it's a very small island with only 160,000 people. It has clear boundaries of where the impact ends, just basically where the water starts. So it's the perfect testing ground for seeing, hey, can we actually create what we call a complementary currency for a small community or nation um, that doesn't have to compete with any of the existing systems. It's just adding on top of it where the current economy may be failing, which is primarily nature conservation, um, education, and these kind of concepts. I oh, love it. And I think that's amazing. And you guys, I mean, you've been pushing on, for, on this for, the, I think, the last two years. Initially, it was called... Uh, you guys tried like Curadai, mm -hmm. you had the Caribbean blockchain network, and to see this all blossom uh, with Collectivo and Celo is beautiful. And I wish you guys a lot of success in it, and I hope that I'm able to to visit you guys in Curacao uh, sometime soon. For sure, we should do a big DAO event in the Caribbean next year. Yeah, I mean the the DAO is in Lisbon was fire, and I'm really looking forward to the next one, and hopefully one of these could be in Curacao. For sure. Um, Look, I appreciate your time. Uh, I think it came out a great episode and a foundational episode on DAOs that I will be happy to share with all my friends that are interested to, to learn about DAOs. Um, appreciate the time once again. Let the people know if um, they should follow you on Twitter, like what's your handle, uh, which projects are you most active in, uh, and all that stuff. Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter, LukeDAO, um, L-U-U-K, and then DAO. Um, you can also find me around the Prime DAO community and the Collectivo project. Um, and if you're ever around a Web3 conference, come check us out at the Taoist. We host um, almost like gatherings for Taoists. And um, yeah, if you're interested, that's the place to be. Tickets are always very, they're free, but they're very limited. So be, be quick with signing up. Um, but we'll have at least four of them in the first half of, of next year. So um, lots to look forward to. Um, thanks so much, Sivko. I really appreciate this. Um, really appreciate everything you guys are doing um, in this initiative. Yep. Appreciate it, Luke. Thanks for being on the show and to we'll catch up soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.